I am so excited to be speaking here to all of you today. I know that might make me a little bit weird that I want to speak in front of a thousand people, but that's okay. I know I'm a little weird. All my life I have enjoyed being an individual who is different from those around me. I'm over six feet tall, but I still wear heels so I can be even taller. <laughs> As a volleyball player on long flights to away games, I would sit cramped in my seat doing my calculus homework while my teammates teased me for being a nerd. I still find your mom jokes <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> and I will laugh loud enough that someone a mile away can hear me. I don't know anyone exactly like me, and I truly enjoy it. Some of you may be thinking, she is crazy. Who wants to stick out all the time? Isn't it nice to just fit in sometimes? Whether you want to be different or feel you are more different than you are, it's okay. We are supposed to be different. We were individuals in the pre-Earth life, and we will continue to be different individuals in the next life. This was important knowledge for me to gain because as I think of working towards perfection, a common goal for many of us, I worry I may lose some of my personality traits that allow me to be me. If we are all perfect, kind, faithful, obedient, and knowledgeable, will we all be the same? It's kind of like Syndrome's statement in The Incredibles when he says he will sell his inventions so everyone can be superheroes. Quote, and when everyone's super, Ha, ha, ha. No one will be. <laughs> now, I don't fear all of us are going to be perfect in this life. Of course, none of us will be perfect in a lifetime. But as I continue to work towards this common goal, I want to keep my sense of self. How can I keep my individuality while striving for perfection? I will work to answer the following questions and discuss examples. First, what defines our individuality and why is it important? Second, what is perfection and what attributes define it? Do we have to be the same to be perfect or can we be different? Third, I will give an example discussing a group of individuals who represent both perfection and individuality. Fourth, I will focus on us, where we are and where we go from here. How do we learn to strengthen and love our individual attributes and become like Christ? First, what defines our individuality and why is it important? One of the ways we're individuals is through our gifts, those things which come more easily to us. Our innate capabilities help define who we are and are often related to those things we are naturally inclined to enjoy. In addition, we all have very different experiences in life, which results in an infinite number of perspectives. To illustrate the importance of these differences associated with our personalities, I will use an example of my college senior design project. Here we call it our capstone project. It's a final culminating experience of your undergraduate education. As you may guess from my job here as a mechanical engineering professor, I was at one time a mechanical engineering student. To attain this degree as a senior, you must design and build something that solves a given problem. For my senior design project, we were given the task of creating a cheap machine that would test the strength of objects under a dynamic load. Now a dynamic load means a force on an object that's changing over time. It increases, decreases, increases, decreases, and continues. For example, all of us sitting here on the stand represent a static load or a constant force on the structure that it must withstand. But if all of a sudden everyone stood up and started jumping up and down at the same time, this would represent a dynamic load. Our weight is applied, then removed, applied, then removed, I'm unsure if this stand has been dynamically tested. Would anyone like to jump with me and find out? <laughs> no takers? Okay. <laughs> well, dynamic loading machines are generally not cheap because they must move, and our goal was to make a cheap one. With a few other senior mechanical engineering students, some of who, all of whom had taken the same courses and had the same educational background, we began brainstorming ideas to solve this problem. In this phase of the design process, it became immediately clear that our variety of life experiences was essential to a good design. Although we all had the same formal training, because we each came from different backgrounds and spent our free time doing different things, our individual inspiration for what this machine would look like was also different. 
One student, whose parents owned a business melting metals and creating art, had ideas associated with changing the temperature, which would cause expansion and contraction, thus applying an oscillating load. Another, who enjoyed sailing, discussed systems of pulleys, which can change one directional motion into a rotational motion. A few of us rode bikes and had that rotational motion of the wheels on our minds, the loading's dynamic on the wheels as they rotate. With a number of other ideas and discussion, we eventually settled on a disk system where the rotation would provide the dynamic process while a single connection would allow for one directional loading. We moved on to accomplishing mathematical calculations, computer drawings, building a prototype, and writing a report. In this stage of the process, our individuality and preference became clear. I quite enjoy the math and took the bulk of that responsibility. Although I can create computer drawings, one of my teammates was not only better, but truly enjoyed creating them, so he put his main efforts there. The same was true for building and writing. Together, we were able to create a cheap, working machine which applied the necessary dynamic loads to the objects to be tested. None of us alone would have come up with the final design we used. Individually, we would not have been as successful or enjoyed the work as much. It was absolutely necessary for each of us to truly be individuals with different ideas stemming from different life experiences and different preferences, while all still being qualified mechanical engineers. This important aspect of who we are, our individuality, which made our senior design project so successful, comes from God. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf said, some may believe that the church wants to create every member from a single mold, that each one should look, feel, think, and behave like every other. This would contradict the genius of God who created every man different from his brother, every son different from his father. Even identical twins are not identical in their personalities and spiritual identities. The church thrives when we take advantage of this diversity and encourage each other to develop and use our talents to lift and strengthen our fellow disciples. So we are supposed to be different. We were created as such for our individual growth and the growth of our friends and neighbors. Our individuality began before we were here and will continue on after we leave. We can and should keep our good personality traits and remember those experiences which allow us a different perspective so we can empathize with and encourage others. So if being different is so wonderful and by divine design, then what attributes should we change? Well, for example, I personally have a bit of road rage. Um, I would maybe call it more road frustration. I'm easily annoyed by people going slower than me or not immediately taking off when a red light turns green. I don't believe my quickness to anger is an important attribute to my individuality. I could just say, it's who I am, so it's okay to get mad. But I don't think that's the best solution either. Which brings me to my second set of questions. What is perfection and what attributes define it? Do we have to be the same to be perfect or can we be different? As we are changing and growing to become like our Heavenly Father, there are some things about us that will become similar. No one gets mad at each other on the road anymore, which is probably a good thing. But I highly doubt we will all grow to attain the same sense of humor or love of classical literature or desire to run a marathon just because we are striving for perfection. To attain perfection, we must follow the only man who lived on earth that was able to do so, our Savior Jesus Christ. Preach My Gospel outlines nine important Christ-like attributes. Faith in Jesus Christ, hope, charity and love, virtue, knowledge, patience, humility, diligence, and obedience. As we further develop these attributes, we become more Christ-like and thus more perfect. So how, as we develop these necessary attributes, do we still keep our own personality? As I mentioned, I've not quite completely developed the Christ-like attribute of patience, especially on the road. I don't usually yell or cut people off, but as I pass, you may see me saying to myself, come on people, let's go. I don't think this makes me a horrible person, but it definitely is not Christ-like. A while ago, I decided to start listening to Spanish teaching podcasts while driving to help with my impatience. Now, if you see me talking in my car, I'm no longer asking you to go faster. I'm practicing saying very important phrases such as, donde esta el queso? (laughs) 
This practice of trying to become more patient has also taught me to learn while just listening and repeating. I have always been the type who needs to see things in addition to hearing them. Now I have the capability of learning in a new way. Thus, in the process of becoming more Christ-like in patience, I developed a new personality trait which defines who I am, and it is one I am much more proud of than road rage. As we become more perfect, we actually become more individual, and our divine self emerges. Quoting President Uchtdorf again, while the atonement is meant to, make, to help us all become more like Christ, it is not meant to make us all the same. During our lives here on earth, we can learn who we truly are, not who we are in the worldly sense, where we say, eh, that's just who I am, and then do whatever we want. That is the natural man. Instead, we can deepen our understanding of who we are as divine sons and daughters of God, heirs to a throne. And as each of us becomes perfected, we allow ourselves to be reminded of that person who we were and who we can become. And it's not the person next to you. It's the person in your seat. They have your adventurous nature, your quick wit, and your dramatic flair. They are you. It is you. No matter how faithful, hopeful, charitable, virtuous, knowledgeable, patient, humble, diligent, and obedient you become, you will never ever become your neighbor. This knowledge brings me peace, as I want to be me, and keep those personality traits which define me, no matter how weird I am. But I also want to be perfect and eventually have all those Christ-like traits as well. On the slide shown, I've listed a few personality traits which you may have, but which are not necessary for perfection. Take a look at the slide and see if you can find some of your traits. Some of my own personality traits from the list are competitive, independent, systematic, playful, relaxed, and high-spirited. These are all personality traits which can set us apart while still allowing us to be similar in those traits which make us more like Christ. I hope this brings peace to those of you who feel too different as well. We have much in common, but each of us should bring an individual personality to this life and the next, as it is necessary for growth and progression. Some of our differences are very clear here on Earth. We have different physical and mental capabilities and are obviously imperfect. But what about perfect beings? They have developed all the attributes I mentioned earlier. They've gained all knowledge. Are they the same? This brings me to my third point, an example of perfect beings who are different. The only group I can think of in this category is the Godhead. The Godhead consists of three distinct beings, Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Are they the same? It has been stated many times that the Godhead is one in purpose, in 2 Nephi, and now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ and the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. And in 3 Nephi, for behold, verily I say unto you that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are one, and I am in the Father and the Father in me, and the Father and I are one. It is clear that the Godhead is one, but we know this means one in purpose, not one in being. Each member of the Godhead is a distinctly different individual and has a distinct personality. We can know this because we can know each of them individually. Do we know our Heavenly Father? Not just as a part of the Godhead, but as our Father, as a divine being who wants us to join him in glory and exaltation. I do. I know my Heavenly Father as a loving, caring, overseeing Father who is there for me when I need His strength and guidance. He encourages me, He supports me, and He gently lifts me when I fall. As we build our relationship with Him through intent prayer and honest action on His words, we come to know Him as our Father. My Heavenly Father is real. He is an individual, and He cares for me. Do we know our Savior, Jesus Christ, our elder brother, who has provided a way for us to return to our Heavenly Father? There are so many stories of Jesus Christ's life and teachings throughout the scriptures that we have many opportunities to get to know him and his personality. One of my favorite personality traits of Christ is his immense love and caring for the one. 
While thousands listened to his sermons, he still had the desire to meet the needs of the individual one. He healed individuals of maladies, including blindness, leprosy, lameness, and even death. He forgave. He paused to bless little children. Suffer the little children to come unto me. In Matthew chapter 15, we read an example of his giving time and care for the one. After preaching along the coast, a woman whose daughter had a devil was pleading with the disciples who wanted to turn her away. Christ was tired and would continue preaching again soon anyway. She could come back then. But in verse 24, we read Christ's response to his disciples. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus Christ could not turn away even one of the lost sheep. And this is not an isolated incident. He knows he was sent unto all the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But he does not think of us as some amorphous blob that he's trying to pull along with him. He thinks of us as individuals that he must walk alongside and lead. I believe his concern for individuals is a part of his personality. He does not just care for everyone in the broad sense, but he cannot help but pause for one in pain. This is his personality. While some might expect this of someone who has felt all our pains, it was true of him before he could empathize with us through his suffering in Gethsemane. And it was true of him after his suffering, when he in unimaginable pain, about to be led to his execution, paused to heal the ear which Peter smote off the servant of the high priest. My Savior loves me. He loves the one. The atonement which he performed has affected me. It has brought me forgiveness, strength, and eased my pain. I know he, as an individual, loves me as an individual. Although he is one in purpose with our Heavenly Father, he is a distinct separate being with a different personality whom I am honored to call my brother. Finally, do we know the Holy Ghost? He, unlike God and Jesus Christ, is a spirit which immediately clearly separates him from them, but he also has a different purpose in the Godhead. He is that spirit which brings us truth and peace. As Spencer, President Spencer W. Kimball said, he is a reminder and will bring to our remembrance the things which we have learned. He is a testifier and will bear record to us of the divinity of the Father and the Son. He is a teacher and will increase our knowledge. He is a companion and will walk with us, inspiring us all along the way. I know the Holy Ghost is a distinct being who has testified, inspired, strengthened, and walked beside me as a companion. He is not my Heavenly Father or Jesus Christ. He is the Comforter, and He is my friend. Talk about a dream team! Three perfect, distinct individuals working together to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Each has their own role, and it is essential that they be different to accomplish their goal. In fact, what would be the need to emphasize their oneness throughout the scriptures if their perfection already made them the same? One of my research areas provides a good example for how we can be the same in purpose, but different individuals. My specialty within mechanical engineering is called fluid dynamics. This is the study of liquids and gases moving, such as the air around your car as you drive, or water flowing through the Hoover Dam creating power. Specifically, I research how water behaves on superhydrophobic surfaces. On the left, you see a water droplet falling onto a smooth hydrophilic or water attracting surface, which sticks to the surface. On the right, you see a water droplet falling onto a super hydrophobic or super water repelling surface, which bounces off of the surface. The structures shown below are about 10 microns in size. That's one tenth the diameter of a human hair. Here, you see a few other examples of water droplets falling onto super hydrophobic surfaces of different shapes. You can see here the water still bounces, or on the right, rolls from the surface. Notice in the right video, as the droplet rolls, it takes the dirt in its path, leaving a dirt-free streak. For this reason, we call these surfaces self-cleaning. I'm sure you can think of many applications where this would be beneficial. Never needing to clean your shower, perhaps. Or getting the last drop of ketchup out of the bottle. But the point is not how cool they are, although they are very cool. It is how they are made. There are two very important components. First, the surface must be water repellent. 
And second, a text string on the micron level, level or smaller must be added to the surface. The result is that water will rest only on top of the microstructures, causing it to beat up almost entirely into a sphere, enhancing rolling and bouncing. We make these surfaces through chemically etching into silicon wafers and then coating them with Teflon, the chemical used in some cookware. A video of water droplets falling on our surfaces is shown on the left. Other researchers here at BYU also create these surfaces by growing carbon nanotubes. They're about 100 times smaller than the microstructures. In the center video, you see liquids being repelled from a range of surfaces. These were sprayed with a commercial coating with microbeads embedded into the liquid spray. The leaf in the right video shows that these surfaces occur in nature as well. There are many more ways to create superhydrophobic surfaces, but all of the methods allow for the same properties which make them so popular. They have a microstructure and are chemically water repellent, and thus they are self-cleaning. They are the same in purpose, but each has been created using a different process and looks different at the microscopic level. One final example of working towards perfection while keeping individuality is the current first presidency of the church. <clears throat> Our prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, can be seen gleefully swinging in the left image. In the center image, we learn who Cosmo the Cougar really is. It's first counselor president, Dallin H. Oaks. <laughs> And finally, in the right image, a man who could give President Worthen a run for his money, and we might need him tonight against Gonzaga, President Henry B. Eyring. <laughs> These three great men have wonderful, different personalities. We can see this from the way they speak, stories from their lives, what they are most passionate about, and how they interact with each other and us. But on January 18th of this year, they spoke, united as a new presidency to the members of the church in an unprecedented broadcast from the temple. President Russell M. Nelson said, as a new presidency, we want to begin with the end in mind. The end for which each of us strives is to be endowed with power in a house of the Lord, sealed as families, faithful to covenants made in a temple that qualify us for the greatest gift of God, that of eternal life. Our new first presidency is made up of three amazing individuals whose new purpose, together as one, is to help us make and keep sacred covenants. Their different personalities working towards the same goal is what makes them a strong team. And so we have come to us, my fourth point. Where are we and where do we go from here? How do we learn to love and strengthen our individual attributes as we grow towards perfection and gain some similar attributes? Let me use myself learning engineering as an example. One day as a kid, I was out in the garage trying to find something to do. I noticed a few pieces of wood and thought, I can build a shelf. I know what a shelf looks like. It has sides, a top, a bottom, a few shelves in between. So I asked my parents if I could use the few leftover pieces of two by fours in the garage to build a shelf. I started by putting the bottom next to the side and hammering in a nail, and the top next to the side and hammering in another nail. After a few more nails, and a few times hammering the garage floor, I had made a shelf. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> it sat kind of at an angle, unless you touched it, in which case it fell over. <laughs> Um, I knew it wasn't a good shelf, but I was still proud of it. I had never built anything from such raw materials before. I enjoyed making it, I enjoyed learning, and I was proud that I had tried. Sometimes my choices in life feel like that first shelf. As I faithfully act to try and improve a Christ-like quality in myself, I get it all wrong. I am sure more than a few of you can relate to attempting to be obedient by reading your scriptures at night only to find yourself waking up on them the next morning. Our first attempt will not be our best attempt, but we must try. We must act, or we will never be able to build on that first, likely failed, experience. Our next attempt will be better, and the next one better after that, until we are perfect in that thing. My first foray into engineering was not a success. But I have built on that significantly, and although I would not say I am perfect in engineering, I would say I am much more proficient. I had to have that first experience. I had to act to guide me to the end result. 
As I have grown as an engineer, I have expanded my knowledge and capabilities such that I have become more diverse than when I knew so little. I could de design and build any type of shelf now, whereas when I first tried, I could only build a wobbly structure that might stab you with nails. As we become more perfect, more like Christ, we become more individual. We begin to comprehend our eternal nature. We recognize truth and are able to think more deeply about it, leading to a better understanding of ourselves and others, and thus to a stronger individual identity. C.S. Lewis wrote, Good, as it ripens, becomes continually more different, not only from evil, but from other good. As our knowledge grows and our hearts change in our quest to be more like Christ, we do not lose our individuality, but we come to know our true, eternal, individual self. You are and always will be the one, the individual Christ so regularly spoke of finding and saving. But your neighbor is also the one. They are different, but growing to be more like Christ and themselves as you are doing the same. I pray we can support each other in this quest of perfection and individuality as we work together to build the kingdom of God. I say these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.